Good afternoon. My name is Shalonda Griffin, and I'm a Community Relations Coordinator here at Gifts of Life Michigan. And I'd like to welcome you to our self-care series today. I really hope that you are having an amazing day. Life is pretty fantastic, but we all know it can also be pretty stressful. There's work, there's school, there's this never-ending global pandemic. The world around us is just rapidly changing and it can easily exhaust us both mentally and physically. And that's why we have this self-care series. It's to encourage you to take some time for yourself, to relax, to breathe, and to pour into yourself because you cannot pour from an empty cup. Now, whether you're watching this live or if you're watching the replay, we would encourage you to feel free to, to ask any sort of questions you might have about today's topic or to leave a comment. And also feel free to share this stream with any friends and family who you think might enjoy today's topic. And today's topic is super amazing. Uh, I have been looking forward to this because I'm going to learn a bunch of new stuff. We are going to be discussing the great outdoors in nature therapy. And let me tell you, my outdoors uh, experience consists of walking my dog for very short walks because she's tiny and going for bike rides in the summer. So we have two wonderful guests who are going to share their love of the outdoors with us. So I would like to welcome Jeff McWilliams and Jennifer Tismeric to today's show. Hello. Good afternoon, Shalanda. Hi. Hi. Now, the name Jennifer Tislerix may sound familiar to some of you because she is my colleague. Now, Jen is normally behind the scenes as our digital communications specialist, and she's in charge of making our websites and our social media looking top notch, which she does so amazingly. And she's also in charge of running live streams like today. And I am just so thankful that I was able to get her from behind the camera and in front of the camera today. So I really appreciate both of you being here today. Now, let's get our show started and learn more about the great outdoors. Now, Jeff and Jen, you two met through Solar Outdoors. Can you tell us about that? What is Solar Outdoors? So Solar is a social club for people who like to play outside, basically. Um, our members uh, hike, we paddle, canoes and kayaks, we camp and backpack, basically do all sorts of outdoor adventures. Uh, we are primarily based in Southeast Michigan, but we have members across the state and across the country for that matter. Um, this group, uh, Solar Outdoors Club, is unique in that we meet in person once a month or by Zoom these days as well. Okay. And that includes like an entertaining or informational presentation. It's not just a business meeting. Our members like Jeff uh, lead activities and teach skills to each other. So we have more people to play outside with. And what's really unique is we have this really large loan closet of gear people can use, uh, members can use for free. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of money on stuff in order to go play outside. That's really awesome, that loan closet. I like that a lot. Now, how long have both of you been members of Solar Outdoors? Uh, my husband and I joined in 2005, end of 2005, or beginning of 2005, I think. Okay. We joined, I think, the tail end of 2007, my wife and I. Okay, nice. Now, were you all always into outdoor activities? Did you develop a love in childhood, or is this something that you discovered later in life? Go, Jeff. Oh, well, so I grew up in Alpena, Michigan, which is uh, northern Michigan, and um, our family didn't have tons of money to spend on, you know, elaborate vacations and stuff, and so a lot of our summer vacations were were going out onto state land and camping and, and fishing and hiking and stuff when I was a kid. And uh, I was also fortunate in that where our house was situated was kind of on the edge of town near a bunch of wooded land. So growing up, you know, into our you know, early teenage years and stuff, it was really easy for me and my friends just to walk out the door and, you know, ride our bikes or even, you know, go a couple miles away from our homes and we'd be in wooded areas where we would, you know, build forts and explore ponds and, you know, do the silly stuff that teenagers do when they're out in the woods. So, yeah, that was, uh, you know, being out in the woods was a pretty natural part of growing up, but um, I didn't really uh, uh, learn a lot about backpacking until as an adult, we found the solar club and took classes ourselves from other folks who were passing on the skills and really learned properly, like what it means to, to backpack and be comfortable in the outdoors. Nice. 
So I grew up in suburban Detroit and my early life when I was like grade school, we had a marsh at the end of the street. Basically it turned into a park later, but before it was built into a park, it was just this open marsh. And I remember going and like catching tadpoles and frogs and garter snakes and like keeping them as pets for the day and you know, bringing them home and letting them go again. And, um, my grandparents owned a cottage up north uh, near Gaylord and we would go up there every year in the summertime for a week or two and you know, I'd be playing, going fishing and playing on the beach and in the water and catching minnows and catching crayfish and frogs and stuff. So I was definitely always into the, the, the animals and the aspect of just hanging out outside and being out there. Um, my husband and I did some hiking and some camping, I guess, early in our dating days and our early marriage. Uh, and we similarly came across somebody who introduced, introduced us to solar and took off from there, found, found backpacking, which kind of was a gateway into all these other activities, a lot of the other activities that I do outside. And, and it was just uh, a whole new way to appreciate the outdoors. Great. Okay. Now you both mentioned backpacking. Now you all enjoy a variety of different outdoor activities. Some of them are different from each other, but you do both share a love of backpacking. Uh, now I feel like I just learned what backpacking was the other week. So for people like me who might not know about it, explain what backpacking is. How would you describe that experience? So here's a couple of pictures where you can kind of see backpacking kind of combines hiking with camping, if you will. So um, in the ideal world, I'm hiking around a mountain. I love the mountains. Um, but you move from spot to spot uh, most nights and you carry on your back everything you'll need for however long you're going to be out there, whether it's one night or two weeks. Um, so carrying tent and sleeping bag and food and toiletries and water filtration and um, things, everything you're going to need. But I would, I would describe backpacking as sort of this portal into a magical world. There are just so many amazing things you can see in the backcountry that you can only get there by foot. Uh, you cannot drive there. And I love that reward when I go someplace really cool and just see things that I wouldn't otherwise have been able to see. It is stress relieving for me to be out in the country and have nothing to worry about except getting from point A to point B. Mm -hmm. Those are some beautiful photos, by the way. Um, can you share that location? Yeah, uh, on the left was uh, Mount Rainier. Uh, my husband and I and another friend spent 11 days on the Wonderland Trail, which goes around Mount Rainier in Washington State. And the one on the right was actually in Michigan's Upper Peninsula. Um, we were in the Porcupine Mountains with our niece and nephew and a couple other friends, and a tornado had gone through a couple weeks before and taken out a bridge. So I'm actually on a fallen tree going across the river to get from one part to the other. Nice. What about you, Jeff? What has your backpacking experience been like? Uh, probably pretty similar similar to um, Jen's. You know, it's uh, certainly the the remoteness is uh, a big draw of, of why we go out there, right? There's there's no cell coverage out there. And that's a good thing as far as I'm concerned. You know, I don't want to be thinking about work or, you know, what else is going on in the world. Um, you know, we go out there, sort of forget about our daily troubles and unwind and to seek adventure too. And um, uh, seeking adventure with friends is even better in my book, you know, mm -hmm. if, if you can do that because it's um, a fairly unique experience that uh, I enjoy sharing with other folks, you know, um, and, and seeing the look reflected on their faces uh and knowing that they're feeling the same thing i'm feeling like just that wonder and that awe about the sort of places you go to and like wow this is just so beautiful and such an incredible place and aren't we lucky to be able to be here uh to do this cool uh so these pictures here look like you're in a very amazing place do you want to tell us about that yeah so this um these particular photos are um in california's high sierra so this is along one of the popular hiking trails called the john muir trail um and so this was a, a section of a 90 ish mile uh hike that we spent i think about two weeks uh doing a few years ago and so um the one on the right is actually toward the beginning of the trip. The first thing we had to do was to uh, take a boat across this lake to get to the trail on the other side, because that's where the trail starts. And so from there, you get off the boat and you put your backpacks on and you start hiking. That's really beautiful. We have another picture too from that same trip. 
Uh, same trip. Yep. Um, yeah, we were stopped for on the left. We were stopped for actually it was both are in the same spot. We were stopped for lunch um, really close to Kings Canyon National Park is where this one was. And uh, and that's actually called John Muir Rock, that large boulder on the right hand side. And the, his name is actually carved in there with the date um, and the trail was established. Now, speaking of lunch, do you normally take dehydrated food packets with you? How does the how's the food situation work out when you're out there for two weeks? So breakfast and lunch, yeah, something you can easily grab. Um, I'll often bring like granola and dehydrated milk, like freeze dried milk, powdered milk um, in mm -hmm. a Ziploc bag, add a little bit of water and a spoon and there I go um, for breakfast or lunch might be cheese and sausage or something like that. Um, dinners tend to be de yeah, dehydrated meals because water water weighs a lot. And so mm -hmm. as you're moving around, you want to carry as little as possible, as light as possible to make yourself go faster and have an easier time. So the more dehydrated you can bring with you and just add water as you're out there, the easier it is to carry it. Um, so yeah, free, warm up some water on a, we have these little stoves to heat up water and add it to your dehydrated food and let it sit for 10 minutes and boom, dinner's ready. Okay, sweet. Now, Jeff, you are also a rock, ice, and mountain climber. We have a photo that we're going to share a little later that I love it. It's what drew me in. Uh, so which came first, rock, ice, or mountain Tell me about that. Rock climbing. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll start with describing what each of those are and then how I got into those. Um, so rock climbing, basically you can have a, a, a rock cliff and that cliff can be anywhere from 30 feet high to 3000 feet high. And wow. and your goal is to to climb it, right? You get to the top and then you, you make your way down one way or another. Now, most of my rock climbing, you know, the cliffs I typically climb are, you know, 75 feet high at the most, just because that's sort of where I'm at in the sport in terms of my skill and stuff, right? There aren't a lot of destinations from Michigan that you can get to that are easy. Um, so, it, and because of backpacking and other things, uh, you know, you have to pick what I'm, what adventure I'm going to go on on what weekend. Right. Um, but the good thing is, especially here in Detroit, you know, we do have several uh, gyms that are dedicated to rock climbing. So you can climb indoors as well. And that's how I got started was attending the Planet Rock Climbing Gym, which at the time was located in Pontiac. But okay. they've since re uh, moved to Madison Heights, but they also have one in Ann Arbor. Mm -hmm. And there's also Dino Detroit, which is a separate climbing gym that's in downtown that you can go to as well. Those and so are they those will, rock walls? Yep, it's a rock wall okay. and they'll lend you all the gear you need. Um, so you'll have a harness, um, you know, which is, you know, something like like one of these this, mine's kind of dirty and nasty looking but that's what you wear um and you have a rope that's tied to that so when you climb uh, if you were to slip and fall the rope catches you because you have your partners on the other end of the rope taking up the slack the whole time so you have a harness and then you'll have climbing shoes like this and they kind of look like slippers um, but they're a lot different than like a hiking shoe because you can see that um there's a lot of sticky rubber on there and the soles are very flat but rigid, right? Because mm -hmm. a lot of time when you're on the wall, uh, your footholds may be very small. Uh, and so you need that type of rubber and that design to really get your toe on those little, those little footholds. Um, so that's rock climbing. Um, ice climbing is sort of like rock climbing, but it's something you do in the winter. So you may have a waterfall that freezes solid in the winter and becomes a column of ice or a wall of ice. And I think during your intro little video, there was a, a brief image there of, of on a wall of ice that was in there as well. And so you do the same sort of thing where you may rig a, a rope to an anchor at the top and you climb it. Um, the difference being instead of um, shoes and using your hands, um, you'll have something like um, what we call a crampon like this. Okay. So it's got lots of sharp pointing points on it. And so you will kick those into the ice and those will support your feet. And then for your hands, again, since it could be almost vertical or beyond vertical, um, you'll have a tool like this. This is called a, an ice ax, an ice climbing tool. And so you'll whack these um, to gain a purchase on the ice and you hold on to those as you move your feet up the ice. 
Um, so then mountaineering um, is focused on summiting mountaintops, right? And mountaineering, that could be as simple as feeling like it's just a hike to get to the top of a mountain um, to something a little more challenging that maybe has some, some rock climbing elements to it or even some ice climbing elements. Or if you go out to Gen Height around Mount Rainier, I've been climbing on Mount Rainier where you have glaciers up there that you're walking along. And so those can be icy and slippery. And so again, you'll wear the crampons on your boots um, and do that. The most extreme example of mountaineering obviously is Mount Everest. And mm -hmm. I'm sure most people have heard of that and maybe even watched a documentary or a Hollywood depiction of what that's like. So that would right. be an extreme example. So yeah, I, I got into it after joining Solar. There were some other friends that I knew in the club who were like, hey, let's go check out rock climbing at Planet Rock. And they had done this before. And so that was where I got introduced. Um, and mountaineering was similar. Um, there were some folks who were mountain climbers who ran a class through the club and said, we'll teach you how to go mountain climbing. And then we'll go out to Mount Rainier and some other places and climb. And so that's what we did. And I've done, you know, a few others here and there, nothing grand like you see in, on TV and stuff. But it's, it's pretty amazing to stand at the top of a place like that mm -hmm. and, you know, see for miles all around. Well, they all sound pretty grand to me. And until we connected a few weeks ago, I had no idea that ice climbing was a thing. Um, so do people, when a, when a waterfall freezes over, is that something that people can can climb? I mean, is Niagara Falls a, a place where people go ice climbing um, or not so much? I, I know there's at least one professional climber who has climbed uh, Niagara. Normally, I don't think that's open to climbing. We're actually pretty lucky because as Michiganders, um, Munising, Michigan, which is on the Lake Superior coastline up mm -hmm. in the UP, um, that's a fairly big ice climbing destination in the winter. They actually have a, a festival every year that draws hundreds of people from around the U.S. who come to climb and take classes and give presentations on other adventures they've been on. And so they have, um, I don't know the exact count, but um, dozens, um, you know, upon dozens of different locations along that, sh that Lake Superior uh, pictured rock shoreline that are climbable. And they can be anywhere from, you know, 20 feet high to, I think the, the tallest one is 300 feet high. Okay. Um, we're also fortunate, and, and this is where you might allude to that photo you were going to show. We have a place in Fenton, Michigan known as Peabody Ice Climbing. And this is a guy who, when the conditions are right in the winter, he has a 55 foot tower and a 70 foot tower that he will run sprinklers from the top all night long and cover those towers in ice. And then you can go out there and climb. And it's a great place you know, one of the unique places, really, I don't think there are that many in the United States that you can go to a place like that um, in a metropolitan or rural area mm -hmm. and, and climb ice to practice and build your skills or just to have fun and try it for a day. Nice. Fenton is about 15 minutes from me. Now, I'm not feeling bold enough to try ice climbing, but I might want to just observe if that's something they let me do. They so, they do, and they do. I, I haven't seen him publish a date, but they normally have a, a festival um, every year um, where folks will come out, and they encourage folks to come out and, and try it out, too. Um, they also did recently host the um, – um, invitational for the national um, climbing team because this mm -hmm. is a, a professional sport as well that they do competitively and they hosted that out there um, and so you'll see i think for the next winter olympics they're hoping to get ice climbing as a competitive sport in the olympics so you'll oh, be able to see cool. that happen soon nice nice thanks for sharing that sure. now jen you also uh, you snorkel and you are a certified scuba diver. Now, for those that might not know the difference, how does snorkeling and scuba, and scuba diving differ? Sure. So snorkeling is something anybody can do. All you need is the snorkel, which is basically this plastic tube that goes from your mouth to the air. So as you're swimming at the top at the surface of the water, you can still breathe the air from above the water while you're looking down at the fish and what have you below. Mm -hmm. Um, so you just need a snorkel, a, a mask to cover your eyes so you can see, 
and maybe some fins to help swim a little bit faster and stronger. That's it. You can stay up I've there. I've done that. <laughs> Isn't it fun? <laughs> it's really like, fun. It's like you're looking at an aquarium from above, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. And you can do it for, like I said, for as long as you want. I, If I had my choice, I'd probably be out there for hours at a time just watching the fish doing their things. It's, mm -hmm. it's really, really cool. Uh, scuba diving is similar, except you replace the snorkel to breathe from the surface with a tube that leads to a tank of air that you carry on your back. Mm -hmm. And that tank of air allows you then to go underwater really deep, um, 40 to 70 feet, probably about as deep as most recreational scuba diving typically goes. You can go much deeper, um, but in, you can't stay underwater for very long though, because that tank is gonna run out of air. So the deeper you go, the shorter the amount of time that you've got available to you with that tank for reasons that are complicated and won't bother getting into, but um, you might stay underwater for 20, 30 minutes, maybe 40 if you're pretty shallow. Mm -hmm. um, but there are more risks involved when you're dealing with that tank and you're that deep into underwater. And so there's some safety measures you need to take. And I definitely recommend if somebody's interested in doing that, that you go get certified. Um, Jeff and I are both PADI certified. It's a, one of the two organizations, I think just two, that certifies scuba divers. So you take classes for a while um, and you go, um, not just book learning, but you go into in our case, a, a quarry in Ohio uh, that does a lot of the Michigan scuba diving shops take people to to practice several times underwater with instructors who are called dive masters who will teach you how to do this stuff. Um, there are a lot of resorts you can go to that have what they call, I think, a discover scuba course. So it's kind of that whole multi-week training, um, a surface level of that condensed into, I think a few hours or something. So people can at least get a flavor for what this is like without having to invest that much in it. So that's something that people can do too, just to kind of check it out a little bit. Okay. Um, yeah. So where are your favorite places to snorkel in scuba? I like to go to the Caribbean as my favorite. I like the warm water. Um, okay. Many, many awesome things about these lakes around us here in Michigan, but I prefer snorkeling and scuba diving in the warm water. There are just such unique creatures down there um, between the, the coral and, and the flora and the fauna both. Uh, the fish and the plant life down there is just beautiful. You're, you're watching these animals and these plants, I guess, in their natural habitat, just mm -hmm. doing what they do. Uh, you can you, you kind of almost get a sense of their personalities sometimes if you watch them long enough. It's, it's really rather cool. I think of it as being, rather than looking at that aquarium from the surface, you are in there with them in the aquarium and you just, it's, it's beautiful. Nice. Nice. You, you pretty much sold me on this. I kind of want to learn how to scuba dive myself. Excellent. <laughs> now, Jeff, you teach a land nav navigation class. Tell us about that. Well, so, so with land navigation, you know, my idea is um, it's, if you're going to go uh, for a hike or backpacking in the woods, uh, any distance uh, from your car, it's really important that you don't get lost, right? Because that can agree. be a real drag <laughs> if, you know, you make a couple wrong turns and next thing you know, you have no idea where you're at and how am I going to get back to my car? And all of a sudden, maybe it's getting dark and cold. And so now what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, so... So that's one of the, the reasons I'm pretty passionate about um, teaching map and compass. Um, and that's to learn how to navigate with a map and a paper map and a compass so that you can keep yourself from getting lost and find your way too. Um, even if you're not lost, um, you really wanna kind of know where you are, especially on these bigger backpacking trips. You know, instead of saying, gee, how much farther is it? Well, you can look at your map and look around you and and understand, oh, it looks like I still have about, you know, four miles to go, but maybe that four miles is is up and over a mountain pass that's going to take me quite a lot of time. Nice. Um, so it's about knowing where you are and where you want to go, and also what's ahead of you that you're going to encounter during your your hike or your backpack or or even your walk. And you know, some of the state parks around here, it can still be really handy to have those skills. Um, on the trails and the bigger parks that know where you're at and you're not going to lose your way. So, so yeah, so we 
um, my, myself and some other folks that I know. Um, Jen's husband, Adi, is one. Um, we teach a map and compass class um, through the club to folks who are interested. And generally, we run one every year. Now, obviously, the last couple of years have been exceptional in that we haven't had those for, for COVID reasons. But we're, mm -hmm. we're excited and hoping that we can bring it back again next spring. At least that's what you know, we're, we're thinking of right now. Um, so yeah, so this is uh, two folks um, who took the class with us several years ago. And part of the, the, the class is we have this navigation exercise at the end where we give them a paper map and we say, hey, on this map, you can see we've drawn circles where these flags are located out in the forest. Let's go find them using just map and compass. And so that's sort of the final exam, if, if you want to call it that, for that class. Just to okay. go find those and we're there with them you know to help them out so that they're not on their own um so that's sort of the gist of map and compass we know that a lot of people with smartphones these days there are a lot of apps on your phone that you can get that have digital maps and will show you where you are and those are great too and we mm -hmm. use those on our big backpacking uh, backpacking trips as well um but there are, you know, some technical reasons why you don't want to completely rely on those. You know, you could drop your phone and the screen can crack or your battery can run down unexpectedly, uh, you know, things like that. So we always teach um, being able to rely on the paper map and compass first mm -hmm. and then introduce people later on to the benefits of also having a, a smartphone. Okay. One of our uh, viewers says fun, which I would agree. That sounds very fun. Now, <laughs> having those map and compass skills are probably uh, important for an activity called orienteering. Is that correct? Okay. Yep. Now, before I met Jen, I had never heard that term ever. So can you all please enlighten me as to what orienteering is? So here's an example. This uses that same kind of flag that Jeff mentioned in his land navigation class. Orienteering is basically a sport where you use a compass like this and a map. It's a really colorful, particularly um, unique map, and it shows it shows hills and valleys and uh, depressions and rivers and all that stuff. And you are assigned a number of these orange and white flags out in the woods to go find, sometimes in a particular order. Sometimes you get to pick the order. Um, it's yeah, competitive for a lot of people. A lot of people who are trail runners like to use it because like to play this this game, if you will, because it engages their mind as well as their bodies. I am not a runner, so I, I hike, but I don't run so very often. Um, but I will go and so I'm, I'm not at the top level competition because I cannot run like that. But I love going out and keeping my navigation skills fresh by finding these things in the woods all the time, and um, it is really cool just to a way to get out in the woods and have a good day. Awesome, I love that. That's a great pick, by the way. <laughs> now, Jeff, you're a certified Leave No Trace trainer. What is Leave No Trace and why would someone looking to enjoy the outdoors want to know about it? So let's talk about numbers for a minute. Um, most of the public agencies that manage our public lands like the National Park Service, National Forest Service and Bureau of Land Management, because they're public, They'll publish numbers on their estimated number of visitors every year and so on. And so you can go look up this stuff. And um, I think the numbers I have are from two and a half years ago because they only publish them, you know, there's a lag between when they do all the math and when it gets published. And they estimate that as of when those numbers were published, um, the National Park saw an estimated 330 million visitors in a single year. Um, state parks saw 800 million visitors in a single year. And to bring it a little closer to home, you know, we mentioned pictured rocks up in Munising. Um, in July alone of 2020, they had an estimated 370,000 visitors in just the month of July to that one uh, national lakeshore up there. And that's a lot of people. And so when you think about that many people all kayaking to the same beaches and hiking the same trails and having picnics at the same picnic areas and parking in the same areas, um, the various agencies that manage our public lands realized um, there's a lot of potential there to have a, a large negative impact because so many people are using the same areas over and over again. So um, 
and and one of their mission statements, especially the National Park Service, um, is to preserve the national parks um, uh, for generations to come. That's actually part of the how it's written into the law that established the national parks, right? So they they have to think about how do we keep you know our parks from being inundated so that when you visit next year, you know it's not trashed and they're you know it's just as natural as it was two, five, ten years ago. And so in the late 80s and the early 90s, all the different agencies started to get together to think about, can we create a set of guidelines that people can use when they go out um, so that they leave the parks and the natural areas as good as or better as when they found them? And so that's how the nonprofit Leave No Trace organization got started. It was a cooperative effort from all the federal um, land management agencies, as well as um, other organizations that are um, in the outdoor recreation um, market, so to speak, mm -hmm. uh, to, to, to yeah, recommend things we can do to, to um, you know, leave the land as good as we found it. And so they have, uh, you can go visit lnt.org mm -hmm. and you can see that they have seven basic recommendations, um, what they call their outdoor ethics. And that sort of teach you things like, um, you know, if I'm walking on a trail and the trail's muddy up ahead, my gut instinct might be, well, gee, I just bought these sneakers last week. I don't want to walk through that mud. So I'm going to walk around, right? That way I can avoid the mud. Mm -hmm. But um, if I do that and then 200 other people come behind me and do that on that same day or, you know, a thousand people during the week, Suddenly, what seemed like an innocuous thing to do was just my single set of footprints going around a muddy part of trail. That's now hundreds of people who have trampled and stomped down that trail and made it instead of a two foot wide trail. Now it's become a six foot or an eight foot wide trail. And so it just compounds the problem. And you'll see this at a lot of the big parks where you see a lot of hikers is the low lying areas that tend to get muddy have these really wide muddy sections because that's one of the things that we really struggle with uh, it's just human nature right we go out there and we're not necessarily prepared to walk straight through that mud but that's the recommendation is i should walk through the mud and not go around because it's just causing further damage to mm -hmm. the trail system and so they have lots of rules like that and you know what do i do when i encounter wildlife so that um, I'm not, you know, having an impact on those animals that are out there in that park and that's where they live, right? They don't have a choice. That's their home and we're going into their home. So what should we do to make sure that we're not negatively affecting where they live when we come to visit? Um, and so, yeah, I went and I got um, certified as, an, as a trainer, which means that I normally incorporate the idea of leave no trace into the backpacking class, which again, folks like me and others will teach through the club mm -hmm. um, typically once a year. Um, and so that everyone has a good idea of um, these guidelines when they go out there. And it's and they're good not just for backpackers, even though that's primarily right now where we introduce folks to them. It's good for day hikers and mm -hmm. you know kayakers and anybody who's going out and spending time in, in the parks or on public lands. You know, a lot of our viewers are people in the medical community. Um, one of them asked about, is this kind of like do no harm? I think there's actually a very good uh, comparison there to the Hippocratic yeah. Oath sort of thing for people who play outside. For sure. Yeah. yeah. I think that's a great comparison. That's really great. Thank you for sharing that information. And thank you for being a trainer and sharing that with other people. I uh, love what you said about enjoy the outdoors, but also leave it so that generations to come can also enjoy the outdoors. That's really yep. important. So that's really, really cool. Now, Jen, you do a lot of things, as I mentioned earlier, and I'm going to discuss another one. You are a road bicyclist and you rack up some miles. Tell us about that. Yeah, so one of the things I got into in the last few years is riding my bike more. Uh, there are different kinds of cycling. Uh, the road cycling that I do means literally I am on roads um, cycling. It's actually safer on roads than on sidewalks. For which, Once you're going more than like 10 miles an hour or five miles an hour, it is, it is safer on the road than it is on the sidewalks typically. 
Um, people like Jeff will, will do this on trails with mountain bikes, but that's not my thing yet. Yeah. Um, so um, my husband and I belong to a cycling club. I started doing this before we joined the club. I actually met a couple of club members in your area, in the Flint area on a long bicycle ride, my longest to date. Uh, that was a 103 mile ride that day. Wow. Um, we met a couple of them and they had my area code, the 313 area code on their jerseys. I'm like, you guys are from my area. So we connected with them. They're actually based in Detroit. It's called the Metro 313 Cyclones. Uh, it is a a chapter of the Major Taylor uh, Bicycling Club. Um, Major Taylor was a world champion cyclist, um, African-American, yeah, right around the turn of the century, 1900 or so, right before 1900. Um, so they named after him. Um, anyway, so yeah, do a lot of some cycling, not enough, but some. Uh, I have aspirations of doing a lot more. My road bicycle, is the kind that has like the curvy wheels at the or the curvy handlebars at the front mm -hmm. that you kind of lean into. Mm -hmm. um, it has very narrow tires, uh, so there's not a lot of friction on the road. So it can go a little bit faster, lightweight bike. Uh, I would like to take this opportunity to request everybody who drives a car to leave us at least three feet of distance between your car and the cyclist, ideally more, but at least three feet. By law, you're not, you need to give us three feet because sometimes you know, as I'm riding along on the right side of the road, there might be a sewer grate that's not in good condition or some debris in the road or something I need to go around. So I need a little bit of wiggle room to, to go around that stuff. So end of my PSA. Um, Duly so, noted. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the places I like to do it, I uh, like to ride is, is actually where we're shown here in this picture on the left. Um, this Hines Drive in Wayne County that goes from Dearborn to Northville in 17 miles of road, much of it without traffic lights, most of it without any traffic lights. And there's about like a six to eight foot shoulder on each side of the road. So there's plenty of room to ride and not feel like I'm about to get run over. Um, there are organized bike rides that you can do. There's clubs like ours all over the state. There are also these organized rides that people will go to, like the one I went to near Flint. Uh, that one was called the Ossenmacher. Um, there is a statewide cycling group organization called the League of Michigan Bicyclists at lmb.org. They keep a list of all of these organized cycling events. Um, and that includes actually some gravel and, and trail riding too, um, and road cycling. So whatever kind of biking you're into, go to lmb.org and they can connect you with an opportunity to do that in your area. And I believe I'm sure they can connect you with some of the clubs in your area uh, or the, any bike shop actually can connect you with a local club too. Okay. Great. And the picture on the right is we, we rented bikes in California and did some touring around uh, Dana Point, California a couple of years ago. I love it. Those are great. Those are really great. Now, what if someone is watching this live stream and they say to themselves, Jeff and Jennifer have really inspired me to get outside of my house. What would you say to someone starting out? I would say try lots of things. Um, start, start small if you want. Start local. Um, there are parks uh, from the Huron Clinton Metro parks around Southeast Michigan to state parks all over the place, county parks, city parks, get outside and, and uh, whether it's moving around and doing some hiking or if you sit on a bench and watch the birds and the squirrels for a while to kind of appreciate what they're doing, just in, embed yourself in it to enjoy it. Mm -hmm. How about you, Jeff? Do you have any suggestions? Uh, yeah, I guess in addition to that, um, you know, for the folks that maybe are in downtown Detroit, um, I would look at uh, organizations like the Detroit Riverfront Conservancy, who will give you a lot more information about what's going on with the green spaces they're developing down there. Um, and, you know, Belle, Belle Isle's a, a great, uh, now part of our state park system. So, uh, and I've been there, you know, it's it's a little urban, but there are some nice pockets of, of nature down there. The conservancy, especially in the winter, is pretty amazing to go visit. If you're tired of the cold weather and the gray skies, I've often gone to the conservancy because it's, it's warm and it's so green in there. And it's a nice little pocket of nature that, uh, you know, that you can go inside to visit. And I know there's also the uh, Mathe Botanical Gardens in Ann Arbor is uh, similar. Um, they also have the um, 
the Odolf um, Gardens, which is brand new on Belle Isle. They just spent $4.7 million developing that. So I would, you know, if you're again in downtown Detroit, you're looking for something to explore, um, that I think will be worth checking out, especially as winter gives way to spring and all the flowers and trees start to bud. Um, so there's a lot of opportunities. I think we're, we're pretty blessed in the fact that we do have a, you know, the county park system, as Jen mentioned, the Huron Clinton Metro Parks, our state parks. Um, uh, we have also got the Rails to Trails Conservancy, which develops, um, what is it? I think we're up to um, 2,000 miles of rail trails throughout the state of Michigan. Nice. And so you can go visit their webpage and they'll have a map of all the different trail systems throughout, not just, you know, not just Southeast Michigan, but throughout the state. And again, those are places that you can hike and bike uh, and sometimes rollerblade, depending on whether it's a gravel trail or a paved trail. So um, yeah, there's a, and there's a lot of opportunities like that and hook up with clubs, you know, like solar outdoors or, uh, you know, there are some Facebook um, organizations that you can get involved in as well. I think mm -hmm. there's organizations on meetup for doing different activities. Um, you know, we mentioned the orienteering club. Um, there's, just a, a, a lot of organizations like that that are worth looking into that'll help you get connected if you're searching for ideas or need um, pointers on where to go in terms of parks and trails. I would, I would add that playing outside does not have to be expensive. So Jeff and I, okay, mostly Jeff, gets into a lot of gear. <laughs> so you, you, you can make quite a hobby of collecting cool stuff to play outside with, Sure. but, but you don't have to. You, you can literally just throw on a pair of shoes and some clothes and go out and do things. Um, you can buy appropriate gear secondhand uh, or, or you join a club like Solar and you can borrow gear for free. Uh, there, there's, there are ways to do this where it does not have to be expensive to enter into this activity. Good to know. Very good yeah. to know. Uh, one of our viewers, to go back to bike riding, says that there is a slow roll in downtown Detroit for a more relaxing ride. There are. There's so many really cool rides in Detroit. Um, beat the train, and there's a whole bunch of them. Um, um, slow roll is is amazing. There's slow roll in all sorts of cities around the country, actually, too. Um, but definitely, there, there, are, there are rides out there. Okay. Now, both of you had uh, some photos where you were in California and they were gorgeous. And I think one of the plus, one of the great things about living in California is you pretty much have great weather all year round. Now, if you live somewhere like Michigan, where we have gone from summer to kind of skip fall and just went straight to winter, <laughs> uh, sure it seems that way. <laughs> how can you still enjoy the great outdoors when it gets cold out? There's no such thing as bad weather there's only inadequate clothing. <laughs> so you can totally go out. You just, you learn to layer up. You have a, you know, a thin layer to start with to help uh, wick your sweat away as you're moving. You have an insulating layer, maybe some fleece. You get a wind breaking layer to stop the wind from, from chilling you a little bit and you're good to go pretty much anywhere. Um, the, one of the ways to really learn to endure Michigan winters, if you will, is to find ways to enjoy them, find ways to get outside and have fun with it. Um, I saw we had a comment from somebody asking if we've ever snowshoed. I love mm -hmm. snowshoeing. Um, it's definitely, actually, I think you can see in this picture um, on the left. So Jeff's got his, his ice climbing on the right. And on the left, this is a picture taken on a rest break from doing some winter backpacking. So in three feet of snow, you can go out there with snowshoes and you can even drag a sled behind you with all of your backpacking gear or whatever's on your back in the backpack and go stay for a week outside in the snow. Um, can can definitely do those things, but even just snowshoeing around the area, there's as long as we get enough snow, and there's always more snow if you go north and west from Detroit. Um, but it, even in our area, there's usually enough opportunity to go snowshoeing at least a few times a year. The metro parks are a great place to do that. Um, you can rent snowshoes from some places. I think uh, U of M Outdoor Adventures here in Ann Arbor, which is associated with the university, but you do not have to be yourself associated with the university. You can rent snowshoes. I think REI sometimes has done that. Some other places have. So you can definitely go out there and do that all year round. Nice. Now, uh, can I, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. I would also add, uh, don't underestimate the power of a thermos full of hot chocolate if you're going out there. <laughs> I mean, that can be an amazing addition that really uh, helps enjoy those, those colder days. Um, 
So don't forget that. For Toss sure. that in your pack. For sure. I like that. That I is take, uh, very a few important. Years, a few years ago, I took up cross country skiing as well. Some uh, some folks in solar had taught a course on how to do that. So uh, every year I've been able to go out and do at least one or two days of cross country skiing. I do not own cross country skis myself because I'm not doing it frequently enough to invest in it yet to that point. But the, um, the, darn it, what's one of them? Um, here on Meadows Metro Park. So in the here on Clinton Metro Park system in Brighton, there's one called here on Meadows. They have a, concession in the golf club basically but during the winter they will rent snowshoes so you just go in and they'll give you the, the right kind of poles for it and the right kind of boots and the right kind of of actual snowshoes and they've got groomed trails and you just go out there and have fun with it nice uh jeff do you do any cross-country skiing at all i do yep um and uh yeah there are a bunch of the the metro parks that that uh, will rent skis you have to call around i don't know if they're all still doing it i know stony creek metro park which is in my area i'm in troy and they're up in rochester hills they also rent skis um independence oaks county park and that's part of the oakland county park system they also rent cross-country skis and they groom uh trails in their park as well um so there are a lot of opportunities to rent skis here and then yeah, occasionally we'll also you know, make a, a short trip up north uh, in the winter if the conditions are right and you've got the time. It's not too bad to drive up early in the morning, do some skiing and drive back. We've been known to do that occasionally, not, not you know, every weekend or something, but that's like a special treat to go and have an up north adventure on cross country skis. So that can be a lot of fun. And, and then there are some of the state parks up there uh, as well that will also rent um, snowshoes like Hartwick Pines State Park is well known for um, their snowshoe rental. They have a nice trail system as well as um, they'll do guided tours through the, the logging museum area and some of those are snowshoe based. So they'll sort of combine the snowshoe hike with talking about the logging industry back in the day. Oh, nice. And so that can be really fun. Okay. Shalanda, can you guess what the best part of being outside in the winter is playing in the woods in the winter. Absolutely not. No bugs. <laughs> I do like that. I do like that. I, I can get on board with the no bugs. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> now, I also just want to point out that maybe you're someone who, uh, maybe your health would prevent you from going rock climbing or going uh, cross country skiing, or maybe you're just a city dweller who's you know, you, you're really not interested in going to a park or going up north. You can enjoy nature in your own neighborhood. I mean, never underestimate the power of a good walk, right? That's that's a simple, easy thing that I'm, I think most people can do. Just walking outside their door and just going for a, a walk, be it 10 minutes or an hour plus. So that's also something to keep in mind. Yeah, and if you've got like a community garden or even a small mm -hmm. community park, like our our subdivision has a small community park associated with it. But um, I, I you know, I've seen the community gardens and things too. I mean, those are all great places to to go and visit as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't have to go to a big, you know, national park or state park just to, uh, uh, you know, experience nature and uh, have a relaxing time. Uh, you know, find a grassy green space. Read a book under a tree, take your yeah. shoes off and walk through the grass. I mean, those are pretty special experiences that you can have anywhere. Kensington Metro Park has some gorgeous nature trails um, that you can hike on and see all different kinds of, of animals out there. Um, one of my favorite things to do out there is, is if you take a little bit of bird seed, uh, you can put it in your hand and just kind of raise your hand up and the chickadees and sometimes some of the other birds will actually land in your hand to eat the bird seed. I'm sorry, I don't mean to freak you out, Shalanda. Land in your hand to, <laughs> to eat the bird seed out of it. But this time of year, you don't even need the bird seed. You just they're just so hungry, you put your hand out and they'll land on it to see if you have bird seed. It's uh -huh. really fun. Like you get to look at them really up close. I've been to Kensington Park and I have enjoyed Kensington Park. You lost me at the letting the birds eat from your hands, but I was with you when you said Kensington Park. But you know what? As long as you enjoy it, and I'm sure there's other people who like it, I support it 100%. <laughs> now, we also have a user who, or a Facebook user who says Stony Creek near 26 Mile and Van Dyke also has one of the tallest hills in Macomb County in the hiking trails. And on a clear day, you can see downtown Detroit. 
Thank you so much for sharing that. Yep, that's, that's known cool. as Mount Sheldon. For those who visit there, you can hike to the top of that hilltop. And yeah, you can see downtown Detroit from there on a clear day. Nice. This has been a great conversation. It's been very fun, very enlightening. I learned so much today. So thank you both for being here today. You were you were both delightful as always. And thank you for uh, connecting Jeff to us. And I'm glad that you were able to join us. Thank you for inviting me. This was great. I had a good time. Good. I'm so very, very glad to hear that. Uh, now, I would encourage you to please come back in two weeks on Thursday, December 16th at 1.15 p.m. for a discussion with Gift of Life Leadership and Dr. Chris Sonaday from Michigan, Medi from Michigan Medicine to talk about how organ transplants have changed in the past 50 years since Gift of Life was founded and what sort of innovations are coming in the future. Now, once again, I would like to thank Jennifer and Jeff for being here today. And I would also like to thank our viewers for uh, joining us in this conversation, for asking great questions, and also for leaving some really great comments. Now, for those of you who are watching, if you have any sort of questions about organ and tissue donation, or if you're interested in becoming a registered donor, I would encourage you to check out our website at golm. Org. Now, Jeff and Jennifer both shared some really amazing photos with us uh, of all the great things that are happening outside and all of the great activities they participated in. Now, if you missed that slideshow in the beginning, no worries, because we're going to share it with you again. So once again, thank you all so much for joining us, and I hope you have a great day. Thanks, Londa. Thanks, Jeff. Thanks. Thank you.